We are going to uh, talk about how black holes and galaxies uh, create their mass and reject it. And first, I want, uh, as an introduction, to tell you uh, what kind of black holes we are talking about. Well, first, uh, the definition of black hole, as you know, is an object uh, dense and compact enough that uh, the gravity force is very huge, and then the uh, escape velocity is uh, higher than the light velocity, so they are not radiating anything, and they are black. That's the name. And um, there are two kinds of black holes. One is uh, the end of life of certain uh, uh, stars, when they uh, explode in supernovae and they are massive enough, then they become a stellar mass black hole. And we can see them because in general stars are seen in binaries. So you can have a companion that gives mass to, to the black hole in an accretion disk and then uh, it radiates a lot. So finally, even if they are called black holes, the black holes are the most bright uh, objects in the universe. And you will see why. And uh, these, uh, of course, there are uh, billions uh, in the galaxies, but we are interested today with this one supermassive black hole, which means 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole, which are only in the center of galaxies. So there's one per galaxy in the center in galactic nuclei. And uh, you can compute the order of magnitudes of the radius, uh, what we call uh, event horizons, where there is a point of no, no return, in fact, for the light. The escape velocity is the light velocity. So, of course, if you have the V square equal to GM over R, you can inverse this for the light, uh, of, uh, the light velocity here. And you see that the radius of a black hole is proportional to its mass. So that's why uh, a very compact stellar mass black hole is, in average, much denser than a big supermassive black hole, which is much more diffuse, in fact. So you see orders of magnitude. This uh, event horizon is about 2.5 light hours for a big uh, supermassive black hole. And it's only 3 kilometers for the sun. Of course, the sun is 7, 10 to the 5 kilometer, so you, if you have to squeeze the sun in three kilometer to have a black hole, there's no, no danger. So uh, what are the quantities that uh, characterize a black hole? It's only two, mass and spin. That's why we, we say, we usually say that black hole has no spin, uh, no, no hair, sorry, no hair because there is no, no characteristic. You cannot have a color, a hair or whatever. You have only mass and spin. So uh, mass, it's easy to measure because you have a companion and uh, gravitationally you turn around, you can have the mass. And the spin is more difficult, but uh, there are some effects that uh, in relativity, when you have a strong uh, gravity field, you can drag in your rotation if the, the center body is in rotation. But uh, you will see it's very interesting to know the spin because it uh, reflects the way of formation of these black holes. And we have uh, indeed find, for instance, in this galaxy, NGC 1365, that this uh, black hole is turning at the maximum rate, that is, it reaches the velocity of light at the event horizon. But uh, it's, uh, it's a frequent that you have a lot of uh, uh, rotation. In pulsars, which are the neutron star just before the collapse of black hole, you have pulsars of milliseconds, so you have a star that can rotate 1,000 times one per second okay, on itself. So for supermassive black holes, we know that there is a very good relation between the mass of the center of the black hole and the mass of the bulge of the galaxy. So here, you see galaxies that are symbolized by a disk. You have spiral galaxies with a disk, blue disk, where stars form. And you have in the center a bulge of uh, old stars. And what is proportional to the mass of the black hole is the bulge. So if you have a galaxy without bulge, you have no black hole. In our own galaxy, the Milky Way, we have a very small bulge. So we have a black hole of 4, 10 to the 6 solar mass, so a very small black hole. But in some galaxies, like elliptical galaxies with a big bulge, you have 10 to the 9 solar mass black holes. Well, we know that the black holes are the brightest object in the universe, and we have discovered a little history here. We have discovered it in 1963. Uh, it's Martin Schmidt that made the cover of the Time magazine at this epoch that discovered this quasar. Uh, it is what he saw here. It's like a star. That's why it's called quasar. It's a quasi-star. Okay? And why? Because you see that uh, there are some the spiky diffraction um, um, feature that uh, every telescope does for a point source, so all the star. But you see galaxies are diffuse and are not spiky here. So uh, a quasar like this, it is a nearby. But uh, what he saw is that uh, when you make a spectrum of this star, all the lines are redshifted. 
with respect to the rest frequency by a large amount, and the redshift is Z equal delta lambda over lambda, and it was 0.15, which is for us nearby, but it is still 2 billion light years away. But now we go to Z equals 6 or more uh, to find quasars. So this was the first uh, discovery, but now we know that uh, behind every quasar there is a big galaxy. Of course, at this epoch, they could not see it. But now we have the HST, which is a Hubble Space Telescope, which has a lot of spatial resolution. And then you can subtract with a good PSF the quasar, which is a point source, and discover that there is a galaxy uh, underlying behind. Of course, you have subtracting artifacts in the center. Don't believe there. But then you see that there is a galaxy. And we can um, compute that uh, the, uh, the quasar is radiating a 1,000 times more than the whole galaxy. The galaxy, like Milky Way, is uh, 200 billion stars. So it's uh, radiating 1,000 times more than the galaxy. It's really huge. And um, this particular quasar, 3C273, which is uh, one of the bright quasars in the neighborhood, it has uh, also a jet that you see here. It was also seen in 63. And uh, it is optical. You see also uh, in contours the radio jet. Radio means that it is a light emitted at centimeter wavelength here. And it has a, a large length. It goes outside the galaxy, 65 kiloparsec. A galaxy, it's about 10 kiloparsec, uh, one parsec being three light years, uh, just to give you the idea. And uh, the quasar is able to uh, expel jets uh, in the intergalactic space. And you can see, so for instance, this kind of jet in several wavelengths. You see it in HST, optical. And you can now resolve it, while in 63 it was not resolved. So you see that uh, uh, the quasar is emitting some puff of, uh, of uh, plasma. In fact, what the jet is done is from uh, electron and protons. It's plasma uh, going very fast. Here it Chandra is a satellite in X-ray. So you see uh, even this mission in X-ray. And in radio, it's uh, an interferometer with large baseline that you can see that there is some shocks when the jet arrives in the intergalactic medium. You can compare all these three uh, multi-wavelength uh, jets. And uh, how do we know that they are a relativistic jet, that is, the, the plasma is going at almost the velocity of light? Uh, because there is no line. In fact, the, the emission is a synchrotron, that's electrons in the magnetic field. The mass is very small, and the jet uh, uh, here is very small. But you can see, for instance, here, in this jet, that uh, I repeat here, that uh, you have proper motions. If you look uh, several months apart, You'll see all these puffs that are emitted by the quasars. Uh, here, I don't know if you can see, read here, it's 1999. It's uh, about one year from here to here. So you see at months apart that you have a proper motion of the puff that are uh, sent by the, um, the quasar. And uh, surprise, you can measure the velocity, and they are going superluminal, which uh, means that the, their velocity, their apparent velocity at least, is between 1 and 10 C. Of course, it's not tachyons. <laughs> it's only because the, the, the plasma is just relativistic, may, maybe 0.8 or 0.9 C. But you have an illusion, in fact, on the line of sight. And I will just be brief here. The illusion is due to the fact that the uh, velocity of light is finite. So imagine that you have one of these clumps here is emitting some light in O at some epoch. And then after having uh, run this, uh, this path here is emit another light in P. Of course, there is a, a delay. This P is in advance because it has not, the light has not to run all this distance x. And it is in advance, OK? And uh, the apparent time at which it reaches you is the apparent time here minus the time that the light makes to, to run this x, OK? And because of this, it seems that the light coming from P is arriving earlier. That's why when you compute all this, I have no time to go in, but you, you can uh, compute it. It's very easy. Uh, it's only because uh, the, the jet's coming towards you, and uh, the last point is in advance with respect to the other. And then you can show that uh, the apparent velocity, when you, you make the proper motion, it can go to 1 to 10 C. And then you, if you have the angle 
of the jet and so on, you can measure the velocity of the jet, which is really relativistic. Of course, if it is not relativistic, you, you will have an instantaneous view of the jet and it will be normal velocity. Okay, so um, we know that uh, these jets are coming from this uh, center. So we have a large range of, uh, of scales here. You have an accretion disk, which is near the, the quasar, where the, the gas is going to the black hole. You have also what we call a molecular torus, which is uh, higher, 100 uh, light years, something like that, and which in general uh, can hide the, the accretion disk and the quasar. And then you have, if you make a zoom, you have these big jets, which are outside the galaxy, because this is a galaxy in white, and you have 100,000 uh, light years. So you, you have all this, uh, all this dynamic range, and this emission is a synchrotron emission, which is uh, uh, recalled here. You know that uh, you have electrons uh, spiraling in a magnetic field, and you can, uh, from the frequency at which they, they emit, uh, deduce the energy of the electrons. If the energy is gamma, the mass energy, then the, the frequency of the synchrotron emission is in gamma square, and also in B, because of course there's a, a huge magnetic field in some quasar, you can have 10 to the 12 Gauss, and you can measure some product of the two. You can measure B by other means uh, of uh, Faraday and so on. So uh, we, we know that sometimes the electrons are so energetic that the synchrotron in a, a emission is not only in radio, but also in optical or in X-ray. You have, for instance, the M87, which is the biggest galaxy in Virgo, which emits some uh, uh, jet that you see in optical. You see the clumps here. This is an optical jet, and you see the radio jet, which at the beginning is very collimated, and then after the electrons lose their energy by superton emission, they come back and make the radio lobe. But uh, you see also that uh, sometimes you see only one jet and not the symmetrical. It's just a, a relativistic effect. You have a Doppler boost when it is toward you, and uh, you don't see the other jet, but it is symmetrical, of course. And with a VLBI, that is long base interferometry in radio, you can see the puff just when they are created. So we have a wide range of information. And we think that the jets are emitted because of the rotation of the black hole. That's why the measurement of the radio jet is certainly due to this spin that we don't know, of course, what it is. But I idealized view here an artist view of the processes, is that why these jets are so collimated until uh, 100 kiloparsec or so that is in intergalactic space. We think that the magnetic field, which is huge in the center and in the accretion disk, is rotated because there is a fast rotation here. And you, you see the entangled uh, lines of the magnetic field, and it confines and collimates the plasma. So this can work until the electrons lose their energy and you have radio load. So here is the view of um, a typical, what we call AGN, that is active galactic nuclei. So I will use the AGN uh, just to, to be short, but uh, it is an active nucleus. And um, the statistics are that you have a black hole in each galaxy, but it's not always active. In fact, to be active, you, you should have some uh, mass uh, infalling onto the black hole so that it eats something. And most of the time, he is on diet, he's silent, and you don't see it. It's about 10% of galaxies that have an AGN. And uh, in general, you have also some uh, problem to see it because here you have the accretion disk, the jet symbolized. You have uh, what we call a broad line region, which is uh, large velocities in the center. And then you have this molecular torus, which is a reservoir in, in, in some sort of gas to feed the nucleus. But it hides also. When it is adjoined, you hide the, the black hole. And you don't see this. And we call it the type 2 AGN when you don't see face on. Face on is type 1 and face 2 uh, and uh, type 2 when it is uh, hidden. And for the jet, it's very rare too. In fact, uh, it's only. 10% of the AGN will have a radio jet, so it's 1% of all galaxies will have radio jet. It's very rare, and we don't understand why. Some are radio loud, some are radio quiet. But the radio loud are the very weak ones. That is when uh, you have a low luminosity AGN, you have a radio, radio jet. So here, like uh, this one, for instance, Cygnus uh, A, 
It's a, a very conspicuous uh, radio jet where you see the two thin jet. The optical galaxy is only here, so you see how far, far is there. And you have these radio lobes that are uh, completely uh, falling back. And it is really a weak AGN here. And uh, nowadays, to uh, restart the AGN, you have to uh, move the gas or violently uh, mix the gas. And in general, all the AGN are due to mergers of galaxies. Because if it is a very quiet galaxy, uh, then uh, the, the black hole has made a cavity around and it's not eating anything. There's no star, no gas to eat, and the, the black hole is quiet. So when you have a, a galaxy interaction, and you see here that uh, this quasar, for instance, has a tidal uh, arm, tidal tail, and you, you see mergers of galaxies. And sometimes, but very rarely, you find this kind of uh, two jets uh, quasar. You have two quasars here. It's uh, the two red points here. And four jets, because uh, you have in the uh, AGN in the two uh, galaxies in merging, which since it is only 1%, you see how this is very, very rare. And you have the uh, HST optical imaging of these two uh, galaxies here. It's uh, 25,000 uh, light years. If the radio jet is not straight, it's because the galaxies are moving in the intergalactic space, which is a medium which is highly ionized. So you have like a wind, in fact. You, the, the jets are, are pushed by ramp pressure of the wind. So uh, what is the efficiency of this uh, energy production of the AGN? Uh, it is only the gravity, of course. It's like uh, you have uh, the potential energy of uh, water in fall. You have a dam on a river, for instance, to get the energy. But of course, you have a small energy when you have a dam. Here, you can compute the available gravitational energy that you have if you bring some gas until the event horizon. It's very easy to do. We have already uh, told that the event horizon radius is 2 gm over c squared. So you come and you see that if you have a mass uh, small m here, you can retrieve half of the mass rest mass energy in your black hole. It's huge. It's huge. It's only gravity energy just to fall in. Okay? Of course, it's not all in radiation because there is some kinetic energy and so on. And we observe that in general you have 10% in average, sometimes a little more, sometimes less, but in average 10% of mc square of all what founds fall on the black hole, which is radiated. That's why it's uh, so huge because if you compare to the most uh, powerful energy, it's from stars, nuclear reaction, fusion of hydrogen to helium and then carbon neutron. This is always much lower than 1% of mc square. So here we have solved the energy problem. If we could have a black hole on Earth, there's no problem for energy. You will have 10% of mc square in your power plant. So it's sufficient that uh, a black hole uh, eats 1 to 10 solar mass per year to radiate like a quasar that is 1,000 times more than the galaxy. Now, uh, after this introduction, I want to uh, uh, give you an idea of... Not, not only in the jet. Uh, it is radiated in... Uh, uh, sometimes there is no jet. Most of the quasars have no jet. It's only 10% uh, of the quasars have a radio jet. So uh, sometimes it's only the BLR, that is the broad line region, uh, you have seen the quasar that uh, Martin Schmidt have uh, seen in 63. It was like a star. There's no jet. Well, there was a jet then, but the, the most of the energy was from the accretion disk. It's a point source because the accretion disk is too small. So it's point source which emits uh, X-rays, gamma rays, uh, optical, uh, everything. Every, uh, it is light, uh, which is a point source. There's no jet. The jet is small amount of energy outside the galaxy. Here's a point source inside the galaxy. Because that acceleration is a No, it's a gravity. And then there is shock. Of course, the, uh, when the matter falls, of course, it cannot lose all its angular momentum, so it has to rotate back. And then you have shocks in the... It's heated by the shocks, and it's radiated, all this. So you have you, All the energy comes from the gravity, gravitational energy, to go to A to B. B being the event horizon. So it's only gravity energy, but then the intermediate is shocks and the heating. And it's thermal energy? Is. Is it thermal? Uh, some are thermal and some are then you also accelerate particles. Some, some are thermal, yes. 
there is a blue bump, which is thermal, and then uh, but there is many phenomena. It's, but uh, a large part is thermal, yeah. So now uh, we want to solve with black holes the problem of galaxy formation. That you know that I very simple, in simple way, I give you what is a problem. Here you know that in the universe you have uh, atoms, I, I will call baryons, because there can be uh, atoms that ionize uh, proton neutrons, they are baryons, okay? So you have 5% of baryons, but you have 25% of dark matter, I'm sure that you have heard of, and 70% uh, of dark energy that we will not talk about at all uh, today. But uh, what is an uh, interesting point here is that the ratio of the total universe of atoms to dark matter is 0 0.2, 5 to 25. Okay, point two. Now in galaxies, you have this kind of view, a halo of dark matter around the baryons, the galaxies here, and the ratio is always lower than 0.04. That is 20% of the universal ratio. This is a big problem, we don't know why. In fact, you have to eject all baryons from the galaxies to understand what is happening. And more in detail, this is the relation of the mass of the halo, mass of dark matter. So you have small galaxies here, big galaxies here. You have galaxies like the Milky Way, which is 10 to the 12 in uh, total halo mass, which is here. So the Milky Way is uh, lucky. It has the most of the baryons, but at least maximum is 20% of what is available in the universe. So where are the 80%? And uh, in the small galaxies, it's even worse. You have less than 20% in the big galaxies also. So it's a maximum of 20%, and we don't know why these variants are out. So for small galaxies, we have a solution, because it could be that the variants are ejected by the supernovae, the star formation itself. It's a feedback of star formation. Why? Because when a supernovae explosion, well, it's not only one supernovae, but when you have a starburst, you have hundreds of supernovae in a small region, you create a galactic wind, and this wind is 100 kilometers per second and it is sufficient to escape the small potential well of the dwarf galaxies. So all the gas is going out, so simulations have uh, uh, done that, and it's possible to uh, remove the baryons of a galaxy, of a small galaxy, because the potential well is not deep enough. But for the big ones, it's impossible, because the, the potential well is equivalent to 400 kilometers per second, and the supernova is 100 kilometers per second, so uh, star formation is not enough to remove baryons from the big galaxies. So what is the solution, at least for now, that people try to convince themselves to, is that the AGN, the, the black holes, are pushing all the baryons out. So is it uh, possible that we are going to, to see? First, I show you uh, some evidence for the star formation feedback. Uh, there is a, a small dwarf galaxy nearby, which is called M82 a companion of M81, that I don't know if you know that. But M82 here is a galaxy which is uh, edge-on. You see in Sion here the Hubble image, which is uh, the stars, the old stars. And here in red, uh, you see the dust of Spitzer. And in uh, blue, you see the X-ray from Chandra. So you see it's ionized gas and neutral gas with the dust. And they are perpendicular to the starburst galaxies. Uh, and uh, like jets in a cone, and we think that all this is due to the starburst that occurs in the center of the galaxy. You see the Chandra zooming in. And indeed, we see that there is a, a jet. Well, it's not a lot of mass, uh, but at least uh, there is a way to remove uh, the, the gas of the galaxy and to stop, quench the star formation. There is also this kind of uh, a bubble here in 3079. And uh, for the massive galaxy, so is there enough energy in an AGN to push all the baryons out? That's the question. Then, indeed, there is, because uh, when you compute well, the mass of the black hole, we have seen the correlation between the mass of the galaxy and the mass of the black hole is 2 10 to the minus 3 of the mass of the galaxy. Uh, when I see M gal, it's the mass of the stars, the baryons. The halo is, uh, is in the outer part, so it's not a problem for the center. So the uh, energy in the galaxy, to build the galaxy, you have to uh, put uh, away uh, gravitational energy. It's about equal to the kinetic energy that is in the galaxy, so sigma squared, the velocity squared. 
and the energy that you have to build the black hole, you know that it radiates 10% of this mass energy. So I take 10% m, the black hole mass, c squared. And when you make the ratio, you see that indeed the black hole in its course has radiated 80 times the energy of the galaxy. So indeed you had plenty of energy to even destroy the galaxy. And the question is why we have galaxies today. It should have been destroyed completely. In fact, uh, it is not because the energy of the black hole is not coupled to the energy of the baryons. That is, in general, the black hole make a little cavity in the center, and then it make a jet, so all the radiation and the energy is going away in the intergalactic space, but it's not coupled to the rest of the galaxy. So the rest of the galaxy is unaffected, and uh, you can keep the galaxy. So the big problem is to know uh, how the energy of the black hole is coupled to the rest of baryons, to know if there is a strong feedback or not. And uh, a way to see that there is certainly a good relation between star formation and black hole is this uh, relation as a function of time, look back time. We are here at zero, take our zero, and we are going until to the Big Bang. You know that the age of the universe is about 14 giga year, and uh, in redshift the equivalent here. And we have been able to measure the star formation density in the universe as a function of time, from the Big Bang to, to today. Of course, at the beginning, the star formation is, uh, is starting. There's a maximum in the first half of the life of the universe, you see. We have not reached seven. So all the stars that you see in the galaxies today are formed in the first half of the universe. And then it goes down, and we have the impression that it's quenched by some sort. And then, uh, if you uh, compute also the number of quasars you see uh, everywhere, where the black hole grows, you have the black hole accretion rate. You multiply by some uh, scaling factor, and you see that it's about the same structure. Of course, it's not as well. It's a green and blue thing. So it's not as well determined, but it is like this. It has a maximum at about 10 giga year in look back time. So we have the impression that star formation rate and black hole growth is comparable. It's uh, working together, which is logical because when you put some gas in the galaxy, it first forms stars and then it feeds the black hole. Well, okay, get out of this. So, uh, how this uh, um, feedback of the agen can work? In fact, you have two modes for the agen feedback. First, you have uh, uh, what we call radiative, the quasar. Uh, near the accretion disk, uh, you have a limit of radiation, which is what we call Eddington limit, which is uh, um, when the black hole accretes too much mass, it radiates too much light, and then the pressure, the radiation pressure, is too big for the gravity. So you cannot accrete more gas. Okay, it saturates. You have uh, eaten too much, and then you are fed up completely, and you are obliged to. Uh, repel the gas. Okay? When the pressure of radiation is equal to the gravity, even if gravity is very strong uh, around the black hole, you can reach this limit of Eddington, and then you cannot radiate more. This is what we call the Eddington limit in, in luminosity for a quasar, and uh, it is computed like that with a um, cross-section, which is the Thomson cross-section, interaction of the photons with the plasma, electrons and so on. And uh, if you have in uh, around the accretion disk, this is uh, atmospherical. If you have around the accretion disk a starburst, star formation, then you can apply the same Eddington limit of the star formation. Okay, but then now we have neutral gas. You have uh, dust, uh, pressure, radiation pressure on dust, and you have this uh, sigma dust, which is uh, in fact uh, larger by this factor of 1,000. So in fact, you can maybe found this ratio of 1,000 that is between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the bulge only because of the Eddington limit. In fact, you have two Eddington limits, one for the starburst and one for the black hole. Well, this is one of the feedback that will expel the gas when you are reach this maximum. But if you have not, in fact, there is another what we call radio mode, when the luminosity is much lower than Eddington luminosity, let's say 1%, and it is in general the case, and then you have these radio jets that I've shown to you. Uh, they are really the radio uh, e-galaxies that are very weak EGN. Okay? When the 
the radio we think, we don't understand why, in fact, some quasars are radio loud, some are radio quiet. We don't understand exactly what triggers the radio jet. But in general, they are weak AGN, which are far from the Eddington limit. And um, they, they are, in general, today. Because in the early in the universe, you have more energetic quasars. And today, we have a lot of radio galaxies. So maybe they have merged a lot of things. When you merge two galaxies, you will merge the black holes. And then you will acquire rotation. And that's why they are more in rotation, maybe. And then that's why they made the jet. We think that the, the jet is linked to the rotation of the black hole. So maybe you need a lot of merging to arrive to these jets. That's a possibility, but we don't know exactly. So one uh, feedback that we have well understood is what happens in galaxy clusters. In galaxy clusters, uh, most of the variants are in a hot gas, intergalactic gas. Here is a, a view of a galaxy cluster in X-ray by Chandra. Uh, in general, it's almost homogeneous. And there is 10 times more variance intergalaxies in the ISM, like in intergalactic gas, than in galaxies. Uh, this gas comes from the galaxy interaction and the gas that has been stripped by the interaction. So you have this kind of thing. And here, I show you this image because we have two cavities. Two cavities in the X-ray. The X-ray is at 10 million degrees. And it's a very hot uh, uh, gas. And you see that uh, when you superpose the radio jet, which is in blue, the radio jet is filling this cavity. So we have the impression, and uh, we have the proof, in fact, that uh, what makes the cavity is the radio jet. So you have, at the center of the cluster, you have an AGN, which is in the big galaxy in the center of the cluster. And the AGN is pushing a jet, radio jet, rad radio these particles, and making a cavity in the big uh, amount of hot gas that there is here. So this is a way to uh, make a feedback, this uh, gas will not cool down and form stars. So this is really a, a proof of AGN feedback. Here you have this kind of uh, story in the Perseus uh, cluster, which is here. You have the Chandra X-ray image. You have two cavities. All the yellow is the hot gas at uh, 10 million degrees. You have some cold fronts. If you make an unsharp image and you see the high uh, spatial frequencies, you see that there are ripples which are sound waves, in fact. And all this AGN has made sound waves, making energy in all the gas. So you, you have a way to really make some feedback to all the gas of the galaxy clusters. So it's uh, very efficient. Here in H alpha, you have uh, like a fountain effect. You have neutral gas. It's hydrogen gas that is recombining. So you have these uh, loops of uh, gas, like a boiling gas. And here, when you... Uh, the the colored image is the X-ray. Again, you see the cavities. In white, you see the jet, the radio jet, which are exactly in the cavity. And in black, you see the cold gas, which is seen in molecules, which is very cold this time. It's 10K. So you have really a multiphase gas from 10K to 10 to the 7K in the same galaxy clusters. And it seems that the, it is the, the way the feedback acts. And in some cases, well, it's not only one shot. You can have several puff of the jets. Here you have an example where you see three cavities. Here are big cavities here. You have a second pair of cavities. And the third one, which is the one which is acting now and uh, making this uh, feedback in the intergalactic uh, gas. So the time scale here is uh, from 1, 10 to 30 kiloparsec is about 10 million years. So every 10 million years, you have a, a burst of the jet. And all the, the distance here is run in 50 million years. That's very short, in fact, because it's a relativistic uh, jet. And uh, in Perseus, you see uh, the filaments here, which are uh, the gas which is cooling. In fact, we call it cooling flows. Why? Because the uh, sum of the gas, which is very hot in clusters, can cool down when it is dense enough. The cooling uh, time is uh, inversional proportional to the density square. So if you have an uh, over density, then it will cool. And the gas will come very cold, lose its uh, pressure, and comes down to the AGN and feed the AGN. So the gas will fill the AGN, and then there will be a, a, a repulsion of gas, a jet. And it is a kind of feedback, in fact. So here's a little model that uh, we have run for that. You have a, a bubble, which is the, one of the bubbles of the jet, which comes in bubble. 
And then you see that in the intergalactic gas, there is some overdensity that is due to the shock, due to the jet, which comes here, like a buoyant uh, bubble. And then uh, all this gas cools down from 10 to the 6 to 10K and lose pressure and then falls like filaments. That's why you see a lot of filaments. And this is like a, a little movie to understand why you, you see a lot of filaments falling on the center. There is also a, a second um, discovery recently that uh, you find a lot of molecular gas uh, outflowing out of normal galaxies. This is one example, for instance. You have a, um, a spectrum here of an object, which is here seen in HST, this uh, radio galaxy. And there is a, a Maxwellian uh, Gaussian profile. And what is interesting is the second one. This is seen in the H2 line in the mid infrared with the Spitzer. And you see that the velocity here of this gas outflowing from the galaxy is uh, nearly 1,000 kilometers per second. And this is a very uh, high mass here. You see about one third of the mass. And it's seen also in the blue shifted absorption in the molecules which are very cold, which is the CO. When the molecules are very cold, you have only the CO to see it. H2 is not radiating. But uh, this traces the gas. It's like we have seen also in a typical galaxy like Mercarian 231, which is a quasar and also a starburst. We've seen the same phenomenon you see the central normal Gaussian, and then you have wings in the profile going towards 1,000 kilometers per second here. And also uh, at any redshift, it's even uh, wider at high redshift. You have a profile of the C plus uh, uh, hyperfine line, and uh, you see that uh, you can have uh, 1,000, 2,000 kilometers per second. So uh, this is a recent discovery that has been uh, made uh, since uh, five years only, 2010. And uh, when you see the, in space the, the extent of this flow, it's very big. It's a kiloparsec scale. So it affects all the galaxies. So it's the first proof that we have that the AGN is indeed pushing some molecular gas, or dragging away some molecular gas in the galaxy itself. So it's a way of coupling the AGN with the, the material of the galaxy. So now we have about a dozen of these objects of the outflows measure, and we can uh, try to make a statistics. Is it uh, proportional to the mass, to the luminosity of the AGN? Here you have the lumin luminosity, the power of the AGN, if you want. And uh, here is the outflow rate. So when you have starbursts, it's the stars here. It's not correlated, of course, and we think that uh, the main driver of these flows are starbursts, and star supernova feedback. And when you have an AGN, it's indeed correlated here. And the, the color is the, the ratio of the AGN power to the bolometric luminosity. So you have the biggest one of the biggest outflow. So it, uh, it makes a solid proof that it is indeed the AGN that is pushing this molecular flow because you have this strong uh, correlation. But also there is something very interesting. You can uh, compute the momentum. The momentum of the flow is the M dot of the flow multiplied by the velocity, so the momentum flowing. And you compare to the momentum of the photons of the quasar, so AGN over C. So it's proportional also. It's not one to one, it's a 20 to one. That's a very strange. This means that you have a boost in momentum, you have 20 times more momentum. And as I will show now, it gives you a very good idea of what is driving the outflow. In fact, it's an energy conserving outflow as I will show. But first, I, I want also to uh, uh, show you a, a new discovery also of recent in the 2010-like uh, uh, discovery is the UFO. It's not alien, of course. It's only ultra-fast outflows, which is di discovered uh, very close to the uh, accretion disk. Uh, here you have the black hole. You have an artist's view of the accretion disk and the jet, if there is some, and some uh, we don't know exactly, we don't resolve this region, so we have imagination. We think that these UFOs come from here. So they're very close to the black hole, and we have uh, uh, lines which are highly ionized of uh, iron uh, 25, iron 26, and they are seen in absorption, blue shifted absorption, so uh, outflows in the X rays. So you see the absorption is uh, quite uh, good. Here's a model, but you see the, the observation. So, 
this has been observed in now a dozen uh, objects. It is always larger than 10,000 km per second. That's uh, the velocity is now measured by the Doppler shift of the line. And it can go to 30,000, so 0.1 C. But it's neutral gas or ionized gas. And uh, the view, the schematic view, is that this UFO is right here. And you have the molecular uh, outflows, uh, which uh, carries a lot of momentum. And whatever the molecules you see, CO, uh, you have also HCN, uh, and so on, it's always a lot of momentum in the molecules, 20 or 50 times. Uh, I just uh, also insist that uh, all these molecular flows that have been recently uh, detected can even uh, carry more than the, what you have in the nuclear disk. So they can even stop completely the star formation in nuclear disk because some, this galaxy, for instance, has a disk mass of 2 10 to 7 solar mass. And in the flow, you have a large fraction of it. So indeed, we have in the impression in some of the flows that you can stop the star formation completely. Of course, uh, the, the fact that there is outflows was not new. In the old times, you measured ionized flows with uh, lines uh, which were uh, F2, ionized iron, and so on. Uh, these are very frequent because you see it in absorption. You know that it is outflow, not inflow. Sometimes they are inflow that are red here when the gas is coming towards the, the continuum source inside. But more, most of the time, they are blue, which meaning outflow. Okay? But these are very small amount of mass. It's a few percent, and uh, that's why uh, until uh, 2010, people so, uh, thought that uh, there was no real feedback because there is not a lot of mass expelled from the galaxies. Now we observe molecular outflows, and a question here is, uh, is to be asked, in fact, why they are molecular. Because if you have flows of 1,000 km per second, they create shocks that heat the gas to this million or 10 million degrees, and then you destroy molecules. So it's, not, uh, it's a surprise, in fact, to find molecular outflows at 1,000 km per second. So, uh, why the, the molecules are not dissociated. In fact, we think that they are formed afterwards. They are dissociated and they are formed afterwards. And this is the uh, scheme that we have here. So we have the AGN, you have the ISN, the interstellar medium of the galaxy, and you have the contact discontinuity here, where you have the shock going to the AGN and the uh, shocked ISM, so all the gas which have been shocked, but then it cools quickly, efficiently, and it forms clumps, and molecules reform in these clumps with maybe a time scale of a million years. So this, is, this has been advanced as a solution of the thing, and the simulations are being made. But it's possible that you reform clumps after the shock, and then even you can form stars in these clumps, and you can uh, trigger a starburst from the AGN outflow. So this is quite interesting because, in general, when you see an, uh, an activity in the nucleus, you have also a starburst around. So this is a, a good uh, idea. And what about uh, this uh, momentum boost? In fact, there is two uh, possibilities. Either the uh, flows is uh, not cooling, adiabatic, or it's cooling very efficiently. Or in, in fact, there is all the intermediate steps but what we can uh, say that in some cases, when you have a UFO here, uh, the flow is uh, so quick, then you could have some kind of adiabaticity, so you, you don't cool very efficiently. And if you conserve your energy, uh, typically you conserve mv square. So when you look at the momentum mv, it would be in the ratio of the velocities. Okay? That's why you can have a boost. In fact, you can have a boost in v inflow of the quasars to the Vs of the flow of the molecules. And this can be a factor 50, like the boost that you see. And that's why you can have this. And it works, in fact. Even if you uh, adopt not a complete energy conserving, even you, if you keep only half of the energy that you have in the beginning, mv square, you conserve only half. And then it's sufficient. You see here the, the scenario. You have your AGN win. So quasar mode completely, uh, radiative mode. You have here the gas of the galaxy, the, in the plane of the galaxy. And then you have the molecular outflow here at 1,000 km per second. Then with only this conservation, 
you can have indeed a momentum flux, which is 15 times the, the momentum of the, of the AGN. And it seems to uh, reproduce with big error bars uh, what you observe. So the region where you, you have to be almost adiabatic is this region here. You have the QSO here, the quasar. You have the uh, high velocity, 10,000 or more here. And then you have the shocked wind. And if it is adiabatic, uh, it can be very large. If it is not, of course, it will radiate away and lose its pressure and uh, be very thin. So this region B, if you don't uh, keep your energy, you have uh, the very thin B region and then the region C. And if you have energy uh, conserving, then you have uh, this uh, high momentum that you can give to the molecules. And this, in this case, you have the most feedback to push all your molecules. Okay. So here, we think that uh, this kind of steps, adiabatic or not, is an evolution in the Aegean life. At the beginning, you have a black hole which is growing. So it's not uh, yet uh, gone to the saturation, where you have the relation of proportionality of the mass to the mass of the galaxy. So it is not Eddington limited. And then you have a slow, uh, not energetic uh, AGN. And then you don't keep your energy. You lose your energy. Or your B is very thin. <laughs> and after a while, when you have grown a, a big black hole, then you have more energy. And then you can have very big uh, velocities. And then you can have this region uh, not cooling too fast. And then you have your big momentum. So you have two steps in the life of the uh, black hole. When you are saturated, you are just in the most efficient way to have the feedback and regulate uh, the growth of the galaxy. So these modes, of course, have been simulated, very uh, simple, where you can have the energy conserving uh, scenario here. So you see that you can have a bubble going to 200 kiloparsec. And when you make the hypothesis of uh, very fast cooling, of course, uh, you, you are momentum conserving, but uh, uh, you have very small feedback. The AGN makes a bubble which is very confined. But of course, this is very simple sim simulations. In fact, what you have is more complex than that. You have multiphase. This is an idea of what there is. In fact, it's not homogeneous at all. You have plenty of clumps. And some people are beginning to simulate things like that, uh, meaning that the ISM is a fractal structure of molecular clouds. And you have a jet that uh, tries to find its way in uh, fractal uh, clouds. And you see the scale here in uh, time. It's uh, 24 kilo years, 73 kilo years, and 122 kilo years here. So you see that, uh, indeed, the jet, the plasma here in blue, uh, finds its way. It pushes the cavity. And then after, afterwards, it still couples to the rest of the molecular cloud because it has a backflow. And uh, you can hit also. So it's not only that you hit the, the tube here, but you can have a such kind of thing. So all this is uh, in the process of uh, uh, working, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's quite complex, more complex than uh, I've shown to you. But there is also how you uh, launch the wind just uh, uh, near the accretion disk. I show you two simulations. It's not quite understood, but there are cer certainly either first uh, um, radiation, thermal effects, but also magnetic field, MHD. So both are working in some sense, but I will not enter into the details. And then if you want to explain this very nice relation which exists that I've shown at the beginning between the mass of the bulge, or here there is a velocity dispersion which is proportional, and the mass of the black hole, you have to uh, have not only negative feedback, but also positive feedback. Well, I show you that there is a very good relation. You see here that there are some points that are outside still. You have some galaxies that have a bigger mass of black hole than they should. And these are, in general, in the center of the clusters. They are cannibal galaxies. In the center of clusters, you cannot form a lot of stars because you have a, a lot of uh, hot gas. So these are uh, forming their black hole more than the stars, and that's why they're here. So we try to. Uh, to understand and to interpret this, even if we, it is still not very well known. So what I want just to, to finish with is that uh, you have not only negative feedback, but also positive feedback. 
That is, the AGN can uh, form stars, in fact, trigger star formation. Here you have some simulations where you don't take into account the pressure uh, of the radiation pressure of the black hole. And you see that uh, when you, you take into account, you have a lot of clumps forming in the gas of the galaxy and a lot of more stars. So here you see the, the galaxies uh, with small amount of gas, high amount of gas, without this black hole uh, push and width. And you see that normally in this simulation, you can have a lot of positive feedback, that is the AGN, form more stars than if there were no AGN. So you have negative, but also positive. And is it observed? In fact, we observe in some cases positive feedback indeed. In these galaxies that I've already shown you, uh, it has been uh, demonstrated that uh, the radio lobe, the radio jet here, is pushing some molecular gas and forming a lot of stars, not in the center, but 100 per sec far from the center. So there is positive feedback. And in this uh, Minkowski object also, you see a galaxy, an early time galaxy with a radio jet, which is in pink here. And uh, outside the galaxy, you have uh, uh, some neutral gas, H1 gas that you see in the 21 centimeter, which is in blue. And in the cyan or light blue, you have a alpha, which means that the gas ionized by star formation. So you have a lot of gas that has formed stars due to the jet in pinging on the gas. So this positive feedback is uh, indeed observed. And finally, I show an example of these uh, jets that were observed in very, very low uh, luminosity AGN. It is a Seifert galaxy, a uh, spiral galaxy, where you find a bar and a spiral. And uh, thanks to the uh, very high resolution ALMA uh, submillimeter interferometer, that has been recently in operation, it has been possible to uh, look at the uh, small gas CO, which is in the center, you see inside this small box, you see another spiral in, inside the spiral. And what you see is uh, a jet, again, a very small jet. I think it's the smallest molecular outflow that has been discovered. So this outflow is not only for the big quasars, but also for the small, very small uh, AGN with the small jets. We have seen uh, red shifted and blue shifted uh, molecular gas which is uh, in this uh, ring here. And when you make the figures about that, you compute that indeed you have certainly an energy driven wind because the, the momentum is 10 times the AGN momentum. Okay, so I will finish there. Well, there is an, another one, which is very interesting case also, is that uh, we are uh, wondering if there is a lot of coupling between the jet and the galaxy, but sometimes the jet is in the galaxy, not only perpendicular, why? Because the jet is perpendicular to the accretion disk, and the accretion disk is wobbling inside the galaxy disk. Sometimes the, uh, the jet is touching the galaxy, okay? So we see this very bizarre galaxy where you have here the optical image, which is stars, and in blue you have the hot gas, which is the jets. The radio jet is in blue here. It looks like spiral arms because it's uh, deflected each time it, it uh, encounter the, the ISM, but this in blue it is the jets and it is exactly inside the galaxy. So you can understand in this uh, rare configuration, you can have a large feedback, a large coupling of the jet to the galaxy. Okay, so in summary, I think I've convinced you that we have a lot of uh, interesting physics to, to look at the massive black hole that are uh, really uh, grown in symbiosis with galaxies. And uh, we have for the moment, uh, the hypothesis that uh, the untrained gas in the molecules can indeed make a feedback and maybe the solution to the fact that all the variants are out of the galaxies and not inside the galaxies. So thank you. But the variants, they, they are observed even though they are out of the galaxies or not? Uh, alas, they are not observed. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we, uh, we, have, we know that 4% of the total is variants, but only, we detect only 10% of them, that is 0.4%. So we assume that uh, these variants are hot gas that are in the filaments in between galaxies. Uh, there could be also some uh, cold gas, we don't know at all, but for the moment, uh, we have identified by uh, absorption lines in front of quasar, the Lyman alpha forest, some 20% of it, but there are still 60%, two thirds at least, of the variants that we don't know. And we think that uh, at some part we will discover it by X-rays or uh, O6 absorption. Or, but for the moment, uh, it's still unknown territory. 
But uh, we, we know they are not in galaxy, most of them. Some can be, but not all of them, because we have a rotation curve in galaxies. If we put all the baryons in galaxies, you will have a rotation curve much higher than what is observed. So we know that most of the baryons are outside galaxies. That is a point. <coughs> you mentioned it was difficult to determine the spin, the angular yeah. momentum. Can you tell the direction of the, from the signatures? The, the, the direction of the spin? Oh, it's uh, random. In fact, random because uh, there is no orientation in space. You know, uh, people have tried to find some direction. For instance, if there is a super cluster of galaxies, maybe the galaxies are, are like in the solar system. All the, the planets are because they are formed together. So uh, we can think that in uh, the local group, all galaxies are formed together and should, but it's not true. In fact, uh, they are random, and. Uh, in fact, uh, this points to the question how galaxies acquire the angular momentum. In fact, it is at the beginning when the structure are formed, they decouple from the rest of the expansion, and there are torques from galaxy to the other, and they create the angular momentum. That is, one is rotating this and you're ro rotating the other way. So the, the total is zero, of course, but they are acquiring both some angular momentum. But then it's completely random. And so the, the black hole spin, we think, if it is uh, accreted by mergers, it should be lower than if it is accreted from gas, because gas is accreting always uh, this way. And mergers could uh, go from any direction. So at the end, you should cancel out the angular momentum. So it's still disputed, and um, people make simulation and find sometimes uh, some direction. <laughs>